Would you please turn your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 9? Mark chapter 9, we're looking uh, this morning at uh, verses 9 through 13. And uh, those are the ones I'd like to uh, read for you now. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 9 through verse 13. Remember, this takes place just after the, the Mount of Transfiguration, where the Lord Jesus was transfigured, where he, His glory was revealed, and they began to see who it was that He really was. And of course, um, we recall that that calls us to, uh, to listen to Him. But this is what we read beginning in verse 9. And as they were coming down from the mountain, He gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man should rise from the dead. And they seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I've already mentioned to you that last time we were in Mark's gospel, we, we did see Jesus do something unique. He uh, pulled back, as it were, the, uh, the veil, not so much of his humanity, because I believe the glory that they saw on that mountain was actually the glory that Jesus was to receive uh, in his humanity. He already has infinite glory as uh, the Son of God. Uh, that wasn't pulling back, as it were, his, his human veil so that you could see his divine glory. I think it was really the glory that he was going to receive in his humanity. But it did, of course, reveal to them something of who Jesus really was. And, of course, we know he is the, the Son of God, uh, God the Son. This one who came to save us is no ordinary man. Uh, he is the God-man. And he became a man in order that he might save us. So they saw something of his glory and that glory that he was uh, to receive as uh, that Messiah, as that Redeemer. And of course, uh, because he is the one who was to be glorified and because he is God the Son, that's why we should listen to him. Uh, when he speaks to us, after all, it is God speaking to us, the one who made you, the one who has the right to command you, and the one, of course, who is worthy that you should listen to him. And again, just to remind you, the Lord doesn't speak to you from heaven today, but he does still speak in various ways. He speaks to you through his word, through the Bible. That's the reason why we uh, read the Bible the reason why we read the whole Bible and not just parts of it, the reason why we should listen to what it says because this is not an ordinary book. It's not like any other book in the library written by a group of men. This is, in fact, the Word of God. And God is still speaking to us through His Word. He speaks through His Word. He speaks through His Spirit. His Spirit, of course, shows us that there is something that is unique about these words, that these are actually what God has given to us. He shows us the glory of these words. He also shows us, of course, it's their, their wisdom and their power, and he makes them powerful in our lives by giving us love for it. Of course, another way God speaks to us is through uh, the preaching of his word, God speaking to you now. He's the one who has ordained that someone would uh, take his word and seek to uh, understand it and explain it, and then apply it. So this is another way that the Lord speaks to you. And of course, I think we've already learned um, through the uh, series of devotionals on fellowship that another way the Lord speaks to us is through one another, uh, through the uh, admonishments, through the exhortations, through the encouragements, through the exercise of our gifts to one another. Another reason why, of course, we need to be together and spend time in fellowship, and that fellowship should be centered around the Word of God because this is one of the ways that God uh, speaks to us today. So again, God speaks to us in a variety of ways, but we need to remember to do one other thing when God speaks. We do need to listen. 
we do need to do what he says. As James reminds us it's not enough to be hearers of the word. We have to be doers of the word. It's not enough to hear the words and agree these are good things. Really, we ought to do them. Uh, these are good things. I'll start doing them next week, kind of like a, you know, when you're going on a diet and um, you really don't want to give up that food. You really don't want to start the diet, you know, but you do want to lose weight. Well, I'll start the diet next week. And so you binge and binge and binge. And then next week comes and you don't want to start the diet again, so you binge some more and so forth. And that desire to go on a diet actually makes you gain a lot of weight because you just don't want to get started. We'll sometimes do the same thing with the Bible, don't we? We keep gaining more and more knowledge, and we keep saying, okay, I will put it into practice, but next week, and sometimes we just never get around to doing it. But the point is, we need to do it. It's like with our work, you know, or with our schooling, or anything else that, that's worthwhile, we need to do it and put it into practice right away, and not procrastinate, not put it off. So we do need to listen, we do need to obey. And actually this morning we're going to see a little bit more about this because we see here two wonderful examples of men who didn't just know God's will, but actually did His will and were willing to pay the price necessary to do that. Now on the way down the mountain, Jesus told His disciples, the three who were with Him, not to tell anyone of what they had seen until he had risen from the dead. And again, we're, we're sort of faced with one of those situations where the Lord Jesus, he obviously brought them up to the mountain to show them something. And he also brought two or three witnesses with him to confirm the fact that this actually took place. The reason why he did it was so that others would know who he is. And yet we see Jesus telling them here, don't tell anyone yet until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And why is it that Jesus wanted them to hold back? Why not tell people right away? Well, again, you have to remember the times in which Jesus was ministering. Uh, this was not yet his time to die. As he reveals more about who he is, people who are against him, the people who are in darkness or his enemies, hate him more, and they want to kill him more, and so the, the possibility of his arrest and his being handed over to the Romans becomes greater the more he reveals who he is. And so Jesus has to kind of balance uh, his ministry to allow himself to continue to finish the course, to, to get the gospel out to as many as he needs to preach, really throughout all of Palestine, before he is arrested. So there are certain things that he wants held back until the time when his ministry is finished. And so he tells his disciples, don't tell anyone about this until he had risen from the dead. There was going to come a time when they could tell others, but now was not the time. But then the disciples began to ask, what does Jesus mean by this? Rise from the dead? Uh, isn't this, I mean, is this something that, um, that should happen to the Messiah? Now, this is something that really they didn't know too much about. Um, as a matter of fact, in the Gospel of Mark, it was just in chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus, that was just a week earlier, really begins to tell them that this is what was going to happen to him. In verse 31 of chapter 8, we read this, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. I think that's the first time Jesus actually said anything to them about this. And this was something they really didn't know how to make sense of. That's the reason why Peter, just as Jesus begins to explain it and break ground on it, Peter chimes in and rebukes Jesus, God forbid, this isn't going to happen to you. This was new to them. And so they needed some time really to accept this idea. By the way, um, this isn't the first time that this has happened uh, when the Lord speaks to, to us. This is a part of our spiritual development, isn't it? Uh, we need to have, as it were, broken, uh, ground broken. We need to be introduced to new ideas, and it takes time. I mean, how long did it take you to become convinced, for instance, of God's sovereignty and salvation? You know, it's not something that happens right away, but a person has to uh, see it, but sometimes it takes a while for them to see it. Sometimes it may take a lifetime for them to see certain things. 
Uh, there's other reasons why the Lord may hold those things back from, uh, from his people. It's because they're just not really ready to hear them yet. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. The Lord didn't just dump everything on his disciples the first day. You know, he taught them step by step and revealed things to them as they were able to hear them. And that's exactly what the Lord does for you as well. There are things you're not yet ready to hear, but the Lord will teach you when it is his time. That's something I think we all need to, uh, to bear in mind, especially as we try to communicate truth to other people. We might be giving them something that, that they're just really not ready to hear. We do need to be careful that we give them the things that are most important. What they need to hear right now, of course, if they don't know Christ, is who he is, what he's done, their condition, and what they need to do in order to be saved. But of course, when it is the Lord's time, he will reveal that to you and to them. Now, Jesus introduced this subject to them a week ago. Remember, the transfiguration takes place six days later, and that was later than what, um, what had just happened in Caesarea Philippi, where Peter rebuked him when he actually opened up the subject for the first time. So now he begins to tell them more about this. Yes, he is going to be killed. He's going to be killed by his own people, by the chief priests and the scribes. But he would be raised from the dead. Now again, this was new to the disciples. They, they didn't understand that the Messiah was supposed to die? Isn't this the one who was bringing a kingdom that was going to be set up, and one that was going to last forever? How can the, the king of the kingdom die? And, and if he must die and be raised again to life, what resurrection is, is this is he's talking about? Is he talking about the final resurrection? Is that going to come now? And what about Elijah? The scribes say that Elijah has first to come before the Messiah to set up his kingdom. But was that, a, was that appearance of Elijah on the mount? Is that what Jesus is referring to? What, what is he talking about? Well, not knowing what to make of these things, they do the only reasonable thing they can do, and that is ask Jesus. Verse 11, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Well, Jesus said Elijah does first come and restore all things. But Elijah has already come. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about what happened on the mount. He was talking about John the Baptist. If you compare this incident here, uh, just after the Mount of Transfiguration with one of the parallel passages in the Gospels, uh, he fills it out a little bit more. Matthew 17, verses 11 through 13. Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished, so also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. John came before Jesus. In the spirit and power of Elijah, we read, actually, the angel said to Zacharias in Luke 1, verse 17, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was John's work. That was what the Lord sent him to do, was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And that work was already done. The ministry was complete. He had finished it. And he had sealed his testimony with his blood. The point here is that um, John did what the Lord called him to do, and it cost him his life. Well, Jesus was about to do exactly the same thing. He was about to suffer and to die, but he would rise again. Now, you and I know that Jesus, of course, had to die, but the disciples didn't quite understand it at this point, that he had to die to pay for their sins that he had to die because there was justice to satisfy, God's justice. Your sins and my sins would have condemned us forever to hell. A payment had to be made if we were going to be saved. And Jesus was the only one who could make that kind of a payment, one that was valuable enough because he is God in human flesh. If Jesus hadn't laid down his life, if he hadn't died, then you could not live 
you would die as well. If Jesus had not been raised again from the dead, then when you die, you would not be raised again to life. But Jesus did die, and Jesus did rise again, which means if you trust him this morning, you will live. Now, again, you know these things fairly well by now, but they didn't know it. But there is one principle, is since we know this so well, I thought we'd focus in on this one particular aspect of this passage. One more thing that the Bible continually sets before us, the Lord sets before us as something that we must do, something we must be willing to do if we are going to see heaven, if we are going to be saved. Now, again, I have to be careful when I say that because it sounds like what I'm saying is here's a work you have to do in order to save yourself. That's not what I'm saying. You can't earn your salvation by your works. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God. But if the Lord has saved you, there are things that must be true of your life, things that you will do. And this is certainly one of them. It's something that both John and Jesus were willing to do and actually did. That is, you must be willing to lay down your life for the Lord. Now, if, if you were asked this morning whether or not you believe these things, whether or not you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether or not you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, I imagine that many of you would answer, yes, you do. But how many of you can say that you have given your life for him in the sense that Jesus calls you to? How many of you would say that you are willing even to die for him? Well, actually, that's what the Lord says you need to do if you are to follow him, if you are truly to trust him in a saving way. You have to be willing to pay that price. We saw that a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Pick up your cross, follow Jesus. The question is, are you willing to pay that price? That's what this text asks you this morning through the example of Jesus and of John. Now, this text really tells us two different things. It tells us first that there is a cost to following Jesus, but it tells us secondly that there is also a reward, that it is well worth it. As a matter of fact, you really shouldn't, if you're rational at all, choose any other way. The only way you're going to attain to the resurrection, to life, is by dying to yourself now, today, in this world, and following Jesus. So let's consider first that there is a cost to following the Lord, and that cost is your life. Now, obviously, this is what John the Baptist had to be willing to pay in order to follow Jesus. He had to be willing to give up his life in this world in order to gain it in the next world. I think um, you know something about John the Baptist. You know he was that sort of, uh, we sort of imagine him as this uh, wild-eyed, fiery preacher in the wilderness wearing his camel's hair and eating wild locusts and honey. You know, it just seems a little bit strange, a little bit austere. We do know that he was away from the world. He was in the wilderness. We do know that he gave up certain things, uh, the fine clothing, the soft clothing to wear the camel's hair, which I imagine wasn't very comfortable, and the things that he was eating. You know, I mean, we like to eat lots of different things. I don't think locust is necessarily, I'm not sure if that's a locust fruit or if it's actually grasshoppers. I'm not sure if anybody really knows. But whatever it was, it doesn't sound too appetizing. Maybe if you put wild honey on it, it tastes a little bit better. But so he, he gave these things, he gave up the comforts of the world in order to do what the Lord called him to do. Now, I don't think about this very often, and maybe, maybe you haven't either. But do you realize that John did that because that's what he wanted to do? Because that's what the Lord called him to do. John had a choice. He had a free will, didn't he? He could have chosen to disobey the Lord and get involved in some other things that he shouldn't have been getting involved in, or he could submit to the Lord's will. He's the same as we were, after all. I mean, he was a human being. He may have had different gifts and a different calling, but he still had the same choices that we have, and he made certain choices according to what he believed was honoring to the Lord. He was faced with a choice, am I going to use the gifts God has given to me? 
Am I going to be faithful to the calling that he has placed upon me? Or am I going to seek what I want from this world instead? Well, I think you know what John the Baptist did. Rather than choosing comfortable life in this world, rather than going the direction the rich man did in the rich man and Lazarus, recall, Jesus, or actually Abraham, says to him in the parable, son, you know, in this world you had your comfortable things. You know, this, this was your reward. This was your inheritance. And now you're suffering. Whereas Lazarus, who suffered in this world, now he is being comforted. John the Baptist decided he would rather take the road Lazarus went than the road of the rich man. He chose the difficult road of service. So after he was raised by Zacharias and Elizabeth, his parents, he spent his early years in the desert preparing for that ministry that the Lord had called him to. And when the time came, he preached not a popular message, but he preached repentance and a baptism of those who repent, the baptism of repentance. And he was willing to speak what the Lord gave him to speak. And those things he said were not popular things to say. He told men that they should repent of their sins. They should give up those things that they love so much because they were offensive to God. And of course, because they would be destroyed for doing those things. But he spoke that truth knowing that he was going to offend others. And he died because he was willing to offend somebody who actually had the authority to kill him. And that, as you know, was Herod. So John knew there was a cost to following Jesus. And he was willing to pay it. His example asks you the question this morning, are you willing to pay? Because the Lord says you have to do exactly the same thing. Maybe not in exactly the same way. The Lord hasn't called you to go out to the desert and to eat locusts, you know, and to dress in camel's hair. But he has called you to follow him, to lay down your life, to do what he calls you to do, to speak the truth, even if the people you're talking to don't want to hear it. Now, what about Jesus? Remember that he is the archetype. He is the premier example of what the Lord wants you and me to do. He was willing to pay this price too. He also set aside his own will, as it were, if there was anything within him. Of course, the thing about Jesus is he wasn't exactly like John. He was God in human flesh. And there's an argument, a debate in the history of the church. Could Jesus theoretically have sinned? And, of course, you have to divide that question. You have to say, well, he was a man, so he had the possibility of choosing contrary to the will of God. But yet, he was also God in human flesh and was anointed with the spirit above measure. And so his heart was so much in love with God, he never would have chosen to disobey him. And that certainly is true. So he couldn't have done that in a certain sense. And yet, there were non-sinful choices, I suppose you could say, where you wouldn't be choosing sin, except that it would be choosing contrary to God's will, such as what he did in the garden. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Jesus was expressing something of his heart's desire not to have to go to the cross and suffer, if it were possible, the salvation could come in some other way. But then he also says, if, if this cup cannot pass from me, then let your will be done. Jesus had choices to make in his life, and he chose to do what his father called him to do. He set aside his own will, as it were. In his youth, he submitted to his parents. In his early years, he worked as a carpenter. During the years of his ministry, he gave himself to that work. He lived the truth that he preached, and he was also willing to speak the truth and to call men and women and children to repentance no matter who or whom he might offend. And it eventually cost him his life. You know, the Pharisees hated him, and they plotted to destroy him, and they actually succeeded. But the reason they did was because it was God's plan. And Jesus had to die in order to save you and me. But this was the price that he was willing to pay in order to do his Father's will. Are you willing to pay that price? Jesus says to you, if I can paraphrase what he said to his disciples, because if you are going to be his disciple, the very same thing applies to you. He says, if you want to come after me, 
You must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. For if you wish to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, Jesus says, and the gospels, you shall save it. Now remember that Jesus put you into this world for a particular reason. He has a plan for you. And his plan was not that you would run after the world. It's not that you would try to gain as much of the world as you possibly could. You know, the one with the most toys at the end of their life wins. It's not that you would leave your mark on the world so that your name would be remembered. And it certainly wasn't to waste your life on the frivolous things of this world, which as I've said, when you come to the end of your life on your deathbed, you look back and say, why did I give so many hours to that? It might have been fun at the time, but it's worthless. Why did I throw my life down the drain? God did not put you into the world to do that. He puts you into the world for another purpose, and that is that you might serve him, that you might deny yourself of the world's pleasures. Again, look at Jesus. I mean, he was not rich. Uh, all their possessions they had were basically in a money bag, and that was being pilfered on a regular basis by Judas. When he came to be crucified, all he had was the clothing that they cast lots over. He had really no place to lay his head, as he told one person who said he wanted to follow him. And what about John living out in the desert in such an austere situation? Now, it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy the things that the Lord has given to us, but you can't let those things possess you. You can't let them control you. You have to be free from these things so that you can serve the Lord. He wants you, he puts you here to pick up your cross and to follow him. You know, when we first come into the world and we're not saved, we do give our lives to the world and we do waste a lot of time. But when the Lord saves us and brings us to himself, he says, that's enough. The time that you've wasted is enough. Now you need to follow me. Think about what Peter says in 1 Peter 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Maybe you thought partying was something that was new today, but uh, no, it's been around for quite a while. And there were people who gave themselves to it in those days. Peter says, if you've been saved, you've already wasted enough time doing that. You need to die to the desires of your flesh and begin to follow the Lord. I mean, why would you want to, especially knowing the difference? Why would you want to give any more of your time to these things when the Lord tells you and, and shows you plainly in his word that these things will destroy you. That's all sin can do is ruin you and kill you and destroy you. I mean, that's what the world will do to you. It wasn't too long ago that Greg, I think for the youth, uh, did a study on what about those people that become rich and famous, right? What do their lives turn out like? Well, virtually all of them are destroyed. They're, they, they're destroyed because of the affluence they can have, because of the the different things that, 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 is, that are put within their reach that other people can't reach, so they, they don't even try, basically. All the, you know, well, I guess it would be drugs and all the different people they want to have relations with and marriages they want to go through and so forth. And at the end of their lives, are they happy that they had all those things? Those things literally destroy them. And that's what the world would do. That's what the prince of this world, the one who's in control of it, intends for the world to do to you. But the path that Jesus walked, the same path that John followed, is really the only safe path, even though it may look to us at this point like it's a very dangerous path, because it may cost you your life. Well, it's true that it may cost you your life, but it is also true that it's the only safe path in this world. Because if you go after the world and hold on to the world and and the world is in your heart, you're going to lose something much more precious than your life. 
you're going to lose your soul. And so you have to choose one or the other. Again, Jesus and John chose the path of righteousness. And yes, they suffered for it. But consider where they are now, glorified in heaven. Uh, I think if you ask them, were they happy with the choices they made? Of course, they're going to say yes. So which path are you going to choose? Which path are you actually walking on now? Because that is the path that you have chosen. Now, I did just, I guess, prefigured or sort of previewed a bit the second point, and the second point is relatively brief, although it is a very, uh, well, a very important point that we need to see, too, that the Lord does promise a reward. Again, the end of this path, even though it may be difficult for the few years of your life here, actually brings you to a much better place than the easy path that you could choose. As far as the world's concerned, you know, the end of that path is destruction. If you choose the path that Jesus uh, followed, the one he laid out for you, and the one that John the Baptist walked, uh, you're going to be far happier in the end. Now, the Lord does not ask you to serve him for nothing. God says that he will give you eternal life. Why do you think John was willing to do what he did in the desert? Again, I, I look at what he did, and I, I think that's, that doesn't look like much fun. He really gave up a lot. The desert is not a pleasant place. Again, the food and the you know, clothing and those types of things. Why was John willing to do that? Did he enjoy pain? Did he enjoy suffering uh, just for the sake of suffering? No, he did that because he was looking to the reward. Jesus did what he did because he was looking to the reward for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and despising the shame. The Lord does not tell you to go through all these difficult things but not hold out some kind of encouragement that is equal to and perhaps much greater than what he is asking you to pay. He will give you eternal life. He will raise your bodies also one day from the grave. And he will give you glory. John believed this and so he was willing to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He was willing to go out and to preach a very unpopular message. He preached or prepared the way for Jesus through that message. He told people they should repent of their sins so they'd be ready to receive Jesus. And of course, he died for that message. But it was worth it to him in order to follow his Lord. Then Jesus came and he laid down his life to save you. And as his reward, the Father gave him life and he also gave him the ability to give you life in his high priestly prayer, speaking to the Father about himself. He says this, you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Now, this is the reward that Jesus had. He received life and, he, and eternal life. I mean, as a man, he died. As a man, he was raised and he was he was taken up into heaven, and he now has the ability to bestow life. And this is the reward that he holds out to you for following the same path that he followed. Again, not going down the same path that Jesus personally walked, but to follow Jesus as he leads you in life. He promises you life. And this isn't just life that goes on forever, not just endless time, but it's a quality of life. A relationship with the Father now in this world, a love relationship. To know the one who is perfect love. Again, we've been studying God in the evenings, trying to see why it is we should love him. And everything about him just speaks volumes as to why we should love him. But he is the one who is perfect love, the one who has perfect beauty, the one who can give perfect happiness. You know, the one people that, that are seeking things for themselves in this world are actually looking for these things. They're looking for love. Why is it that these people go through so many different marriages? They're looking for beauty. Why is it they fix their eyes on so many different people? They're looking for happiness, you know, pleasure. I, I guess you, I didn't want to use the word pleasure, but it's what they're looking for. But happiness, I think, joy is what people are looking for in these kinds of things. Uh, they're not going to find them in the things of the world. They 
actually ends with a bitter taste in your mouth. But God is the one who has all these things in a holy and pure way and who gives them, because he's infinite, can give them in a limitless way. He is the one who really holds all these things that men are seeking for. And these are the things that he will give to you, not only now in this world, but forever in a world of pure love, an ocean of love in the new heavens and the new earth that he will create, that perfect world on the last day. This is what John was looking forward to when he went out to the deserts and did those things that were not so popular. This is what the Lord was looking forward to, to be the Lord of that world, that glory, that joy that was set before him of restoring the Father's, um, uh, well, what would you say, his, um, his reputation, no, it's not so much his reputation, but the damage that was done to his justice. Jesus restored that through his work. So looking forward to the reward of loving his Father and of saving his people and the glory that was to be his. He was willing to go through these things. He was willing to lay down his life. So again, John was willing to pay the price. Jesus, of course, was willing to pay the price. The question the Lord asks you this morning is, and especially as you would come to the table, is are you willing to pay the price? Jesus died in your place, if you're a Christian here this morning. When he died, you died with him. You would die to sin and be raised again to live now only for his glory. Now, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, that is what you have, in fact, done. And that's what has happened to you. And that needs to make a difference in the way that you live. So the reminder of that this morning in the table, as well as these examples in Scripture, again, asks you the question, are you willing to let go of the world? Are you willing to stand apart from the world, the, you know, again, the, not the physical world, but the things of the world that you know are bad or evil that will destroy you or sinful, and even the good things that you like too much, you love too much, and control your life, are you willing to let go of those things? And to walk with Jesus, to stand with Jesus, and to engage in the work that he is doing in this world. Well, if you are, that shows that you are born again. That shows that you will live with the Lord forever. You will attain to the resurrection of the righteous. You will stand among the sheep on the day of judgment. The Lord will receive you into his heaven. But if you're in love with the world and you're not willing to let go of the world to follow Jesus, Jesus warns you this morning that you will perish with the world. You must give up your life in this world if you are to receive God's life in the next. I mean, even in this life. You have to be willing to give it up. You have to be willing to pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus. There really is no other way uh, to heaven. And again, a number of people today who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ believe that going to heaven is a matter of praying a prayer. All they have to do is pray the sinner's prayer, Lord, forgive me for my sins and and please receive me, and, and that's, that's enough. And then you can go on and do what you wanted with the rest of your life, and you're going to make it to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. If you are going to see heaven, if you're going to follow Jesus, and that's the only way, because Jesus said that those who follow him, he will uh, prepare a place for in heaven. Uh, he will own them as his own people, but it has to be his servants. He goes to prepare a place for his servants, not for the people who just say that they trust in Jesus, but for those who really do and who follow him. You have to be willing to pay that price if you're going to follow Jesus. Those are the terms. And so basically, that's cost that you have to count before you even decide to follow Jesus. Are you willing to pay the price? Well, I hope you are. Certainly the rewards far outweigh anything you'll have to endure in this life. And even when you endure those things, as Greg's already pointed out, it's a joy to be able to suffer for Jesus. You realize that Paul gloried in the scars, the brand marks on his body, that the, the abuse that he took that was meant for Jesus. And you look at the catalog of things he went through in 2 Corinthians. 
beaten times without number and shipwrecked and out in cold exposure and constant concern, all these things that he suffered. He was even stoned several times to death in one occasion, it appears. And then uh, when they thought he was dead, he got up and walked back into the city. And it's thought at that time perhaps the Lord gave him that vision he refers to in I think it's the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians. But Paul didn't say, you know, uh, this is hard. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of getting beaten up and beaten and stoned and all these kinds of things. No, he said, I glory in these things. It is a joy and a pleasure to stand in the place of Jesus Christ and take the abuse meant for him when he took the abuse that was meant for me. Much worse than I'm going to have to do for him, he took the wrath of God against himself for my sins so I could go to heaven. So it is, it is my joy, it is my pleasure to stand in his place and take that abuse if that's what I have to do in order to serve him. Well, that's the price that you have to be willing to pay. In today's life, it, it's maybe a harsh word here or there. Some people don't like you or call you a Jesus freak or whatever they might, might do. You know, it's a far cry from what Paul had to suffer. But sometimes we're not even willing to do that. We have to be willing. We need to lay down our lives to follow Jesus. He is certainly worthy of that kind of love. So let's bow for a moment in prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to search our hearts and see what it is that we're actually doing and ask Him for the grace to repent of the sin that we find there and to realize that there is free and full forgiveness at the throne of grace. The Lord will forgive us and He will also give us the power to be able to do what he calls us to do in laying down our lives. So let's spend a moment in prayer.